Thank you very much. Okay, so before I start with the presentation, just a few things, uh, two or three items. First off, thanks that everyone's here. I know uh, after a long party, everyone's drinking, enjoying the time, and it's pretty difficult, at least for me as we get older, to get out of bed at a, some kind of realistic time to see all the talks. So I appreciate the fact that everyone's here. Thank you very much. Also, uh, thank you to the organizers. I really appreciate being invited, and um, I hope that my talk is useful to everyone. Second thing is, I don't know if you are aware of this, but just for a brief second, I just want to think about the folks in London right now. There was actually an explosion that happened on the tube about 56 to almost 60 minutes ago. Um, they're in the process of finding out whether that was an attack or not, so I just want to say, just think for a second, hopefully a lot of people um, didn't get uh, affected by that in a negative kind of way. Just wanted to say that very uh, specifically, right? So with that, I'll get into the presentation. So, um, my name's Mike, AKA Idiot, or 1D10T. And um, some of the topics that I talk about and are near to my heart are specifically threat intelligence, risk intelligence. And I'll get into details of what that understanding of that is. Some of the things, since everybody writes a lot about cyber, I like spelling that slightly differently because I can't hear the cybers anymore. So um, some of the things that I take a look at are cyber espionage, cyber warfare, and specifically how this technology uh, slipstreams into some of the different types of attacks that we see that are, I believe, erroneously classified as cyber crime, when in reality, the question is always who's actually behind the attack? How do you find information about these attacks? And what is the general approach that makes sense based on the knowledge that I've built and a lot of the different discussions that we've had together last night and in other meetings. So with that, hope the picture's okay. I think that's a great picture of me. It looks really good, right? So, cool. So this all started off um, in, uh, by basically about 2005, 2006. Um, I was in the security field for um, a specific amount of time for commercial companies, did a lot of different implementations of IDS, uh, IPS, SIEM solutions, et cetera. And I kept on asking myself the question, there's got to be a better way of collecting information, making it actionable uh, for us, and also turning that into specific intelligence so that we can basically get an idea of what uh, and how attacks are done and specifically and proactively use this to defend systems. And after working for different antivirus companies and security companies, which I am grateful for, and doing 20 years of implementations, you think that, or you allow yourself the arrogance to say, well, maybe we can do this slightly better than what we're doing right now, because it doesn't work, right? So the second thing is I started working with friends, some of which are here and presented yesterday, about taking a look at different types of breach information, how this information can be linked to attacks after an initial breach, and trying to find out how we can understand how these breaches lead to different attacks that lead to even other types of attacks, and if they're nation states, if there are groups coordinated with this, and how do we find this out and prove that evidence, right? So, very quickly, um, a lot of the solutions that I saw out there, I came to the conclusion that they promised a lot of things, but they didn't really deliver on some of the initial items that they were promising to their customers, right? So then I started to dig a little bit deeper into finding out, well, how do we classify things? What is the difference between threat intelligence and risk intelligence? And I like using pictures to do that, so just bear with me. So let's start off with a picture. And... Um, this is an awesome picture uh, because it shows, um, in a simple way, threat or risk intelligence, depending on uh, what your filters are and how we interpret this. So I would love to ask someone in the audience if you think this is threat or risk, but um, should I ask someone? Is someone awake? Any, um, anybody want to volunteer? It's both. It's both. Cool. Yeah, in a way, yeah. It could be interpreted as both, correct. So. What do we see in the picture? We see a guy that has the awesome picture of his life. While he's focusing on this awesome picture, he doesn't know that an animal is rushing towards him, and if he doesn't react very quickly, this will end badly, right? So some of the associations that I use in regards to the technology for threat intelligence and risk intelligence, 
For me, this is kind of a perfect example of what threat intelligence is, right? So we have a situation where we don't have the correct awareness of what's actually going on in our environment. And while we're trying to find out these different indicators or compromise or all these different types of data, we don't recognize that we don't even have time to react. We have to react in like a second, right? And I think that's a fantastic synopsis for uh, taking a look at threat, threat intelligence. So here, threats are in the present. They are about to happen or are happening, and we see that in the picture, right? So there's specific indicators uh, of an attack, IPs, um, different types of breach information, that kind of stuff. But the big issue with that is, is that it's already happening or it has already happened. So I don't know if anybody is involved in incident response, but incident response is probably one of the most chaotic types of situations that you're in. Somebody's attacking your infrastructure, you're trying to collect data in a way, shape, or form that makes sense, and you're trying to defend systems, shut down stuff, so that the actual attacker doesn't go any further or deeper into other systems, right? And very often, more than not, when I look at different customers from my side, a lot of the things that we realize is that since we don't have that much time, we make a lot of errors, right? So another thing that with uh, risks, uh, excuse me, with threats, we have structured types of data. So we have kind of an idea of what kind of things that we're looking at. We kind of have an idea of where we need to look for these things, and that makes it slightly easier, although we don't have that much time. So let's take another picture. And then the question again for someone else, not you. <laughs> is this a risk or is this a threat? Someone. Excuse me? Risk. risk, right. So the cool thing about this picture, again, is it's a perfect synopsis of the difference of risk intelligence uh, and threat intelligence. Because here we have a situation where we're looking at a bridge. We're looking at different items within the environment. And each one of these uh, areas or inputs in an unstructured way can lead to an actual threat. That means if we're standing too close over here on the edge, we'll obviously fall off into the water. If we cross the bridge, there could be uh, planks in the middle of the bridge that have holes in them, we fall down into the water. Obviously, if we keep on going, we'll fall into the water as well, right? So the difference here is we have different types of inputs. We have different types of characteristics that we collect. And this is, again, a perfect example in my mind of what risk intelligence is. So we have different things that could be a threat, depending on how we interpret them, and we have different areas that could lead to these threats, right? Perfect example. So if we dig a little bit deeper into that picture and then take a look at that, then risks leverage potential threats that can use exploits from a technical perspective, right? Exploit of loose rocks, exploit of basically the, the boards are defective or have holes in them, et cetera. Risks can happen, but they're not in process, right? So we, since we didn't actually cross the bridge yet, they're not a threat, right? But when we do cross the bridge, they can become a threat. It depends on different things, right? So then usually precursor to threats and attacks because things can happen. And more often than not, they're unstructured, right? So we don't really always know where to look for these things. Uh, and from a technical perspective, this is fantastic about a lot of these things that companies are selling in the market, about breached accounts, about information that they think is the bleeding edge threat intelligence, besides the fact that it's actually risk intelligence and not threat intelligence, and they don't really know what they're looking for, um, they can't really qualify and guarantee that the information they have is up to date. So pretty good examples of that. It's also difficult. When you're trying to find risks, there's so many potentialities, and that leads us to the next point. You're actually thinking about probabilities of something that can or cannot happen, right? So when you guys talk to some companies and they talk about algorithms or proprietary algorithms, think about Thomas Bayes, uh, I believe 1759 or 1758, he created the Bayesian algorithms, which is the basis for probabilities and also for neural networks after that, right? So it's, not, it's open source mathematics, it's not proprietary. So when we compare these two, threats are happening, are about to happen. Threats collect data chaotically, but are known. Risks may happen, A or B or C, et cetera. Risk data collection can be unstructured, so we have to interpret that, which is a pro and a con. Every time we interpret something, it depends on who interprets what we're looking at, right? So it's very subjective. When we try to 
release ourselves from that subjectivity, then the types of data that we collect will make more sense and we may not forget something, right? So it's a potential risk there as well. So risks require hunting, knowing what you're looking for, and thousands of hours of analysis. Um, can anyone agree with that? Anyone do that? Yeah? So I just wanted to state that I know this is basic stuff, but every time I see advertisings for threat intelligence, I'm asking myself, well, is it threat intelligence or is it risk intelligence? Where's the difference? Do you understand the difference, right, with companies that sell this stuff? So threats are real or near real time. Risks are potential futures, and there we talked about the probabilities, right? So the next question is then, if we take a look at that stuff, how do we actually analyze data? So the assumption is deduction. It's based on the different inputs that we see, understanding something. We're assuming that if we see this, that, and that, and that will happen based on history, based on the data sets that we have, right? The second thing is we're looking at principles and standards that everyone can understand and can communicate, forensic science. If we're using this information for evidence, then we have the chain of evidence. We have to adhere to a certain way of collecting that information. If we don't do that, then the evidence that we collect in this instance is not usable in a court of law. A lot of people still don't know this. So reading reports, and this is the thing where it really gets my skin crawling. There's a lot of folks out there that pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for services from dollar random consulting companies that are reports that are full of bullshit. Excuse my French. You know, so you have this 70 page document and I've gone through this a lot of times. And in this 70 page document, the actual pertinent information is about two sentences, maybe three, right? So. When all this stuff is going on, you don't have time to focus on reading through all 70 pages. You want to know what's the important information, how is it relevant to me, how can I take that, extract that, to turn it into something actionable, right? Troubleshooting mentality, do things step by step. If I'm configuring things, if I'm collecting information, that I make sure that if I run into issues or problems, that kind of stuff, that I know what to do, that I have an approach, that I'm not chaotic. This, this will become very important when you run into an incident, right? Continuous learning. Uh, since attacks evolve over time, and I'll get to some details of the attacks in a minute, these types of attacks in the traditional way we approach security no longer works. A lot of folks ask me, um, why doesn't antivirus work anymore? Why doesn't firewall work anymore? The short answer is it does for certain types of attacks but we need to understand that we live in a very dynamic environment, right? And that leads to the next piece. Um, I actually did um, a thesis on trying to find out what defines uh, successful security teams. And some of the conclusions that I found, which were surprising or maybe not surprising, was is that we basically need transformational leadership or servant-based leadership. And that's because security is dynamic. It always changes. If you expect a signature, if you expect a specific IP to always remain the same in each new attack, it's not going to happen. If you do that, you're not going to see what's really going on, right? So antiviruses, by definition, can only cover a certain portion of security because the types of attacks that we look at are always changing. And they change even more when we talk about some of the actual breaches and information that came out from shadow brokers, um, uh, vault, uh, the vault leaks, et cetera. So, Okay, I'll get to the attacks in a second. Just bear with me one more second here. So then data collection. As I started to collect this data, I noticed, okay, well, it might not be a bad idea to collect data in a certain approach that makes sense, right? So in this instance, then use a step-by-step -step approach for that. So forensic science, if I collect information, then verify that that's correct. I can't tamper with it. Find out who the attacker was or is. Find out who the target is or was, and that's probably one of the most difficult things. Uh, because a lot of the forensics or analysis that you do can take um, easily up to like six, seven months. And one of the attacks that I'll get into in a minute for fire sale, it actually took us about six months to actually get the infector file that led to an entire industry uh, being disrupted during elections in uh, Ukraine. And we'll see parallels to other elections in a minute. All right? And then use the facts and evidence to prove or disprove facts. So... Again, some of the reasons why signatures won't really work for newer types of threats is because if you have one signature um, and there's a whole bunch of different types of um, botnets, a whole bit different types of malware that people are selling because you can make money with this, 
it's not really realistic to tell a customer, okay, well, if you buy our antivirus, you're protected. So I'm like, well, how is that going to happen? If you have a signature, the signature is uh, changed slightly, then your antivirus won't uh, detect this, and uh, following that, the infection will happen, and you'll only find out after this happens, right? Which is another drawback of um, threat intelligence. We actually have to wait for an attack to be successful if we're using an antivirus or a firewall, et cetera, in order for it to result in a signature or to it to result in a malicious type of activity that we can record and then block, right? So if you have a whole bunch of different variants out there that are unknown, hence risk intelligence, uh, and you need to find these out, then you'll find out very quickly that signatures are not really going to help you, right? Okay. And that led me to the conclusion, okay, that signatures and these types of technologies actually aren't going to work. So I like getting into a little bit more details now about the attacks. It'll start getting more interesting now. Um, has anybody ever heard of hybrid warfare? Right, cool. So can we see a lot of parallels in hybrid warfare and some of the attacks that we're seeing recently? Yeah. So the really cool and interesting thing is when you take a look at risks, you're trying to interpret the future. And in order to interpret the future, we need to find out what different new ways of attacks. Hence, we need to be offensive in our approach um, in order to find out where those next attacks are going to be coming from. If we take a look at hybrid warfare, a lot of the things going on in quote unquote social media and in other avenues, a picture starts to emerge. But when we take actual attacks over a certain period of time, compare that to this theoretical stuff and take a look at the practicality, an even more interesting picture comes up, right? So some of the things on the bottom, information warfare and propaganda. How many people have heard of this stuff about fake news? Yeah, how many people see things on social media like Twitter, et cetera, about users that come up and say, well, your view is stupid, you know, uh, my view is perfect, or you see a whole bunch of groups of users attack certain people that have a opinion. Interesting, huh? So if we take a look at this cyber attacks, we know diplomacy, information warfare, and propaganda, they fit together. But then look at another piece, support of local unrest. If we transpose this into what happened during the U.S. elections, for uh, the first time in modern history, we had two different political parties that literally cut, wanted to cut each other's throats. That means you no longer get into a discussion and conversation, a, a human conversation about, okay, well, why are you voting Democrat? Why are you voting Republican? But it's just, I hate you because I hate you. And it's like, really? If you think about this, as a risk, you can start to see a trend, right? Okay, so what exacerbates the situation is when we take a look at the way warfare is now being done in uh, the last few years, and we take a look at how attacks are classified, we find out that there's a certain type of disconnection, right? So this is from uh, Hackmageddon, Really cool guy. Um, just go to www.hackmageddon.com. It's not my website. It's another person. What they basically do is they collect research on different types of attacks from companies. They tell them what they think it is, collect the details, and then you get graphs. When you take a look at the graphs, you see that over 64.5% is cybercrime. But is it really cybercrime, or is it more a mixture of espionage warfare mixed in with different technology that we incorrectly classify as cybercrime? If you classify things as cybercrime, then you need to have evidence to support that. That means, okay, well, somebody's making money uh, attacking a specific target for a specific reason. There's no nation state involved or primarily no nation state involved, and there's no organization of these different attack groups. But that's not what we're seeing, right? We see a different picture. So, sorry about the um, animation. If you take a look at the, the cyber kill chain, um, some folks are talking about what different steps are in an attack Having knowledge of this, understanding this, um, makes sense when you take a look at analyzing different pots of data to find out what's actually relevant. And each one of these different areas will be certain types of information that you need to look for and need to know where to look for. And it, uh, in its entirety, builds a chain that appears to be logical, right? And you guys can see this presentation later, so I'm not going to go through all the details of this. So let's take a look at details of attacks that actually happened. 
So back in 2015, uh, we had a call from a customer of ours that we did a SIEM training for. This company I can now mention was Starlight Media. Starlight Media basically controls most of the media uh, channels, newspaper, and outlets for Ukraine. In 2015, uh, we had, I think, I believe it was the November time frame. I'm getting a bit older, so bear with me. Around the November time frame, they had various different local elections going on in Kiev and also in different areas within Ukraine. And the interesting thing was, one day before elections, um, a company called us up, our customer, and like, hey, Mike, you know, we've got this really weird thing going on in our network. I'm like, well, what do you mean? Yeah, well, um, our domain controllers are acting pretty crazy. We're seeing new GPOs uh, jump up. You know, we've got some new drivers that nobody's aware of that they've installed. And we have some client PCs that are starting to fill up, and we don't really know what was going on, right? It turns out that if we take a look at the attacks, uh, we obviously had the plan. Someone was behind this attack. We had an infection phase, so in social engineering, we saw that um, specific emails were crafted in a way, shape, or form that even the best of us would have a, a lot of difficulty recognizing as phishing attacks, right? These phishing attacks had embedded code, um, basically beacons to detect if the person opening up the mail was actually legitimate, trying to get the information from those domains, et cetera, and then um, getting ready for the next piece of that infection. So during this conversation, we found an executable called OLOLO.exe, which was basically filling up the hard drives, um, trying to get an administrator to log on to this client so that they could get administrative rights and then do the installation on other clients. Um, by the way, if you were a domain admin, then it also logged on, it used that, uh, uh, that right to install drivers, signed drivers. Um, it also used um, that right to install timing devices that basically waited for information. We found this, uh, all this stuff out like months later after going through all the code. Um, so basically in discovery, it then connected after it installed and got the appropriate administrative rights to a command and control server. I'll get to the details of the command and control servers and the information later. And uh, basically infected the Active Directory service and spread out. But it didn't just spread out in one company, it spread out through the entire industry. Now this was the first time that we've actually seen an infection that not only concentrated on one company, but concentrated on an entire industry. Right? And that got us thinking. You know, that doesn't really look like something normal that we've experienced before. Usually you get someone that got infected and then you got to clean everything up. But this is the first time that we actually saw something target an entire industry during a time-sensitive event, um, political um, machinations or uh, an election. And we asked ourselves if there was actually more to the story, right? And it turns out there was. Right, so then infection phase two, um, Black Energy 3 Plus was then installed, a rootkit that is tied back to specific groups, uh, did another connection to the command and control server, installed a timer, waited for day zero, and then after day zero came, it basically unloaded the rest of its payload uh, and basically disrupted every type of media industry PC that it could find. After it did that, filled it up, deleted everything, uh, then it disappeared. Right? And this was only for a specific day during elections, right? So kind of interesting, right? It doesn't look like your average uh, dollar random infection. It's a little bit more. So then um, after that happened, we started tracking back IPs, command and control servers, and different groups that were claiming um, that they were behind this or indirectly. And that pointed out to specific groups that we found before, namely a Cyber Burkroot. Does anybody know Cyber Burkroot, by the way? Yes, no? Okay, so Cyber um, uh, Burkroot is basically um, an elite team that was built by Russia for Ukraine, and it's part of their secret police, right? So Cyber Burkroot is then that type of organization that is closely aligned to Russia um, that has caused a lot of the stuff that's going on that you may have heard in the news. Okay, I need to speed up a bit because I'm way too slow. So, end of the day, we found information about the different servers. We tied these servers back to actual DDoS attacks that were nation state associated. And it led us back to a Facebook page from Cyber Burkroot um, that had all this information. So, while all this stuff was going on, you know, we did like every responsible person would do. We tried to coordinate with the, the local government with certs, tried to give them this information, and we did and we wanted to have a relationship that was bi-directional. Unfortunately, it wasn't, uh, and we'll see that in a second. 
So we found this information, we found the servers, uh, but then a day after we reported this information to um, the uh, Secret Service, the FBI, and the Ukrainian Secret Service, the servers went offline. Interesting, yeah. So before we could reach them, they were in different areas, Bucharest, Amsterdam, etc. Some of them actually used um, well-known services that are also used for patch management, by the way. So if your firewall had a rule to stop uh, illegitimate traffic, um, you're not going to block uh, patch update information, right? So that makes it a bit more difficult. So then, as these servers got offline, we saw a message in, in Kyrillic or in Russian, our servers were hacked. Nobody laughs, okay. Really? So their servers were hacked? Um, yeah, I call bullshit on that one. So it was interesting, yeah. So we took a look into more detailed analysis, taking a look at the signatures, trying to find out if this is something that we could tie back to a specific nation. And lo and behold, we found a lot of signatures in the, the payloads that actually traced back to sandworm attacks, which are, I think, a little bit more well-known, right? So, and sandworm was um, targeting NATO, energy sector, telecom, etc., cetera, um, and also tied back to APT38 and 28. There were two different groups involved in that. So these are just some of the pieces of information, what attack vectors they use. I have to speed up a bit because I don't want to block you guys from having lunch, right? So what happened after that? Then I think some of this is known. We communicated with the certs. They'd sat on the information for almost a month. They didn't do anything. Um, about a month later, the airport was attacked in Ukraine. After that, power grid attack number one, all using similar uh, exploits with signatures that we traced back from the original attacks. We told these guys back then that this was a POC and that more was going to happen, right? So after this happened, European attacks, then we found some interesting parallels to the US, DNC, uh, and co, political parties. So we started to ask ourselves if this could indeed be something that we could trace back to Cyber Burkroot and the groups aligned with that. And then this is some of the information that we found on that. So attack on US elections, I talked about this a little bit before. Here is just the timeline of some of the events. So we have a lot of similarities, which was interesting, but I'll let you guys make your own assumptions on what that actually means. Um, so we had cyber heroes as proxies that were used uh, to an extent. Um, I don't want to say which groups, I don't want to make any political statements, but it was interesting that some well-known groups that were supposed to be for democracy and freedom were actually being used as proxies to leverage different types of attacks on people that were critical of a specific person. Again, you make up your mind about that. I'm not going to tell you what to think. Right? Another thing here, discovery. Multiple voter databases were breached. And I'm talking about not only all the addresses and everything else in 2016, some of them were in 2015, and you can verify that with your data set. Um, we also saw driver's licenses with pictures, everything. You had everything you needed to create a persona to register as a voter and then vote for a specific person. I thought that was kind of scary, you know, and I said this. Um, and it was not really successful because I had a whole bunch of different Twitter attackers converge on me, like the mother of all attacks. So it was interesting, not, um, yeah. And then uh, infection, so we had data miners, botnet infrastructures were built up, there was a campaign that was created, we, they waited for new orders. When day zero executed, we saw specific attacks going on on infrastructure. So the interesting thing is when we took a look at this uh, attack on infrastructure, we saw that we had botnets that were associated with Lizard Squad, but the attacks were slightly different. So they were trying to use someone else's attack to hide in plain sight, but we took a look at the targets and we found that a lot of them came from different places in Europe. They then infected different clients uh, in the states and they started targeting specific states. A lot of these are swing states at that point in time. And the communications uh, on these different states, they were the target of that attack. Not companies, not people, but communications. We found that interesting. There's got to be a reason for that, right? So when you uh, basically attack communications, then these different states cannot communicate their results that they tallied back to Washington, D.C., right? The other thing is, if you use something like disinformation uh, in social media, you can tweet that your candidate is winning, when in reality, it's something entirely different, right? But the, uh, the um, 
I'm looking for the right word. The impression is more important than reality in this case. And that was really scary. And we're seeing this in other elections, right? So then some of the details of the Miri botnet, and you guys know this uh, a lot better. I'm not going to talk to you about that. We saw uh, a lot of the things being leveraged in uh, DSL modems. DSL modems were important because they used a lot of DSL modems to communicate these results in these different states back to Washington, D.C. So was it a dollar random attack or was it a combination of an attack that had a specific purpose? The jury's out on that. But it was interesting, right? So millions of people got infected with that. These are just some of the numbers from Shodan, but I'm a bit careful with Shodan because not all the information is always up to date. This is the reason why I have my own sensors to collect this type of information. But it's a good example of some of the uh, effects of that. They all communicated on port 7547 CWMP, which is the management port for DSL modems, right? But I think you guys all know that. Okay, the other thing is that in social media, we saw a little bit of a change. Um, we saw a whole bunch of different hashtags that we were starting to collect, doing probabilistic analysis on, are they attackers, are they real people, are they not real people, or personas? And we found out in a lot of cases, they weren't even real people. We found out in some cases, when we actually managed to get the location and the IPs, that they traced back to St. Petersburg and to some other places, which was interesting. Right? Some of the other stuff that we found was, well, that I won't go into. We saw, it, we saw a lot of this stuff before in other attacks. Cyber Brooklyn used DDoS. They used the uh, Black Energy Rootkit for that. Um, and we saw a lot of different um, similarities, right? We also saw a combination of phishing campaigns, et cetera, which led us to believe that maybe it was the same group, right? So then with uh, Twitter, we tried to compare it with the stuff that we knew about Fancy Bear, and we tried to come to a conclusion of, you know, it's time for us to do some more detailed analysis to find out what's really behind this, right? So, this is a picture that I made back in, I think it was 2014, just talking to people about academic research. And part of the academic research was trying to prove how easy it is to use social media to infect um, different clients and to build your own pseudo network. What a lot of people don't know when we talk about social media is, there's lawful interception tools out there that actually do this very professionally, right? And when you transpose this type of technology, that's a very simplistic uh, way of doing that, you can dedicate campaigns, you can create hundreds of thousands of pseudo users, and then you can tell these users to tweet certain things that are basically standard messages, right? And if you do that, you can drown out a lot of the opinions of actual people, uh, which is a tool that you can use in that type of warfare, right? So then uh, we asked ourselves, was something else going to happen? We said yes. We told this to everyone that would listen to us and wouldn't listen to us. It was still a POC. There were, these attacks were evolving. The technology and code were evolving. And they were getting a lot more organized in the way they did these attacks. So then we started seeing, back in October last year, attacks on the German Bundestag parliament. We saw attacks on Merkel. You know, we saw attacks that were so eerily uh, similar to the stuff in US elections. You know, I went to different entities and I told them, guys, you guys need to be careful. Something's going on. Uh, now would be the great time to start uh, doing something about this, right? We'll see if they did that. I think the elections are coming up in two weeks, right? So we'll see if they did their job or not. We're trying to do everything we can. So what we also did was um, it led me to build up um, a way, shape, and form to start looking at Twitter to try to find out where these different hashtags are coming from, these different types of groups, so that I could track where these users are coming from. Part of the reason was personal because I just got fed up with people attacking me for saying something. The second thing was I wanted to try to provide evidence to say that these things were going on in a, in a scale that no one had previously seen before. I mean, literally after elections, the US elections, hundreds of Twitter users just disappeared. That's not normal, right? And we're seeing the same type of activity. This is one of the screenshots from a few days ago. Obviously, Equifax is one of the big points on there. But there are also tweets in here about, you know, Merkel is this, a whole bunch of derogatory statements, which is interesting, right? So with that, let me just make sure I have some more time. Yeah. If we transpose some of the leaks that are going on, I'm not going to say that it's right or wrong, but I ask myself the question, who's releasing the information? What's the actual objective, right? So 
This is not a political statement. This is just a, an analyst statement. I don't know, but yeah. And um, these are just some of the attacks that happen on my website every day. So a lot of these things I trace back to networks like Baidu, Yandex, etc. So does anyone know Yandex and Baidu, where they come from? Yeah. So I use a lot of this stuff. Um, my website says honeypots as well. So every time someone attacks my website, I collect the information. I put it into my data repository and I start crunching the numbers. Have I seen these IPs and other attacks before? And I have. So. I'm not going to talk about products, so if anyone's interested in that later, we can talk about that. Okay. The other thing is then we saw other attacks like the SMB attacks that were also well-known, WannaCry, blah, blah, blah. Um, also saw a lot of different IPs coming from specific countries where we started to build a specific profile. It was also interesting. Was it coordinated or not? The jury's still out. It looks like it. And then after the initial attacks that came from China, Russia, we started seeing a mixture of different countries come into this as well, right? So trying to hide in plain sight, trying to make it as difficult as possible for you to pinpoint who was actually behind that. Some of the things then that led me to believe that collecting information about risks makes more sense, right? So collecting things like dumps and leaks, which is what you do perfectly, by the way. Yep. Um, I do a very, very small fraction of what this guy does. And if you guys are interested, you got to talk to him because I learned my stuff from him for dumps. So um, exploits, um, does anyone know what ass is? Well, <laughs> attacks as a service. Simple, right? Now everyone will remember me. Mike was the ass. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Feel the love. Okay, and then the different types of attacker groups out there, unknown stuff and some other stuff. Right? So we're collect I'm starting to collect this information so that um, we can build um, a database of risks. We currently have about 5.2 billion uh, risks and threats that we're currently tracking, uh, in addition to all the CVEs and all that other type of information. So if anyone's interested in later on, let me know. Conclusions, you need to see an attack, co a code sample, et cetera, to create an uh, IOC, or indicator of compromise. If you are analyzing an ongoing attack, you make mistakes, obviously, may not have all the relevant information. Signatures in AV are not proactive security. Offensive intelligence makes a lot more sense if you use the same attack strategy that an attacker will use in order to defend your infrastructure, right? And I've had this discussion with politicians the beginning of the week about hacking back, et cetera. My opinion was if you hack me, um, then I have every right to, to pwn your shit. So if I find your IPs, which a lot of you know that follow me, um, if someone attacks my website, I post the domain information, the email, the IP on Twitter, and I let everyone have fun with it, right? So short answer is if don't attack, right? If you do, your information's out there, right? Um, it's not hacking, though. Port scans, that kind of stuff is not hacking. So that's an ongoing discussion um, that we're having. And then I think I'll stop here because lunch is in like five minutes, right? So I hope that was okay. And that means, of course, that you have five minutes for questions. It is awesome. I'm sure there's a lot of questions. Um, I'm, personally, I'm curious. Um, when it comes to attribution stuff, what's the biggest objections do you hear when you try to assign like, an attribution to, 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 to an attack or something? What, a, what, a, what, 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 what kind of objections do you hear? Objections? Yeah. It's like, no, you can't do that. You're making stuff up here. You, you, well, you know. Um, That's what they want you to think. Right. Yeah. So politicians have a completely different view from our reality. And I think um, trying to find that, that mixture is pretty difficult. I spend a lot of my time trying to educate people, specifically politicians, people for, in law enforcement, about what kinds of things constitute hacking uh, in a positive sense and what kind of things are actually cracking, that kind of stuff. So I spend a lot of time trying to set the bar correctly that doing port scans, that kind of stuff, is perfectly legitimate because there's a lot of commercial services that do that, right? Um, hacking back is an issue that I'm probably not smart enough to resolve. I would love to do that. So if someone attacks me, that makes you a legitimate target, then I want to know who you are, right? And that's my view on that piece, right? But it, not everyone agrees with that. There are some problems with it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> 
put it that way. Disclaimer, I have not proactively attacked anyone in any way, shape, or form using any dollar random tool. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Questions? Questions from the audience. Get your hands up. We're going to sit here for five minutes anyway. How difficult is it for you to um, find data? I know my experience is that most of my job is about discovery than it is about anything else. And it's tedious, it's a lot of time wasting, and sometimes a lot of red herrings. So how much time do you think you take building your data? About 90 to 95% of my time. Right, 5% is the queries, the results that you get back, but I mean 90 to 95% of my time is trying to find stuff, trying to find relevant information. And that's the reason why I get slightly perturbed when these guys talk about threat intelligence, because if you're not a member of a forum and you're not uh, ghosting the forum or if you're not proactively monitoring it, you won't pick up threats or, or risks for that matter. Right? So what I try to do is when I uh, talk to people about risk intelligence, um, I try to set the bar that 95% of our job, and that's the reason why it costs so much time and money, is finding these things, right? And then after you find it, the next issue is standardizing the data in a way, shape, or form that makes sense, and then building the infrastructure that supports that, right? It took me about two years to build a system that I'm kind of happy with now, right? And I mean, you've had the same ex experience. What more kind of hacktivist groups that we would normally consider like the good guys have you seen being used? Mm. That's a difficult, that's a good question. It's a difficult question. Hacktivist groups, uh, I got a mixed feeling because part of the question about Jester, I've got mixed feelings about that guy, uh, very mixed feelings about him. Um, there's different groups that are out there. I'm not going to mention any names because I just want right. to let them be where they are. Yeah. Uh, there's some in pieces of information that I think make sense, but when um, a group releases information, my question is always, what's the agenda behind that? So if a dump like uh, Vault 7 or if a dump like uh, uh, Brokers comes out, then my question is always, well, what's the actual agenda? What's the objective? Is there a nation state behind it or not? So I'm a bit paranoid about that. But if there's information that's released by groups, security researchers that know their stuff, and either I know them or um, they appear to be neutral, mm. those are groups that I appreciate because you need to release certain types of information, but you have to do it responsibly. Sure. Again, not an ideal answer. Sorry for that. More questions? My Gen 2 friend. What do you think of these open source threat intelligence lists that will give you like seed loads of IP addresses? Um, on one hand, open source is a great way of validating uh, commercial feeds. Um, my conclusion is, at least from the data that I've seen and the, the feed samples that I get from commercial feeds, is that I very frequently find almost the same data. I don't know if that's good or bad. That's just my experience. Yeah, a lot of it is um, similar data. So um, since I've come to that conclusion, I've started building my own list. So if I can use open source, I reference it and I use that. I tend to not take any commercial feeds whatsoever. But that's my opinion. That's my choice, right? I don't How know if that answers your question. So open source, cool. I use open source too. And if I reference someone's material, I'll credit them. Yeah, okay. How much of the data, how much of the sources do you see that are coming from like Onion exit nodes? Well, I've, there's um, uh, four or five different sites that I use to correlate information about Tor exit nodes, but a lot of the stuff I'm concentrating on is more of DNS information. So I do a lot with DNS. Um, and when you start collecting stuff like malware, those different types of samples, and you're dealing with flux domains, then there's an entirely complex problem. Flux domains are pretty much worthless to me because um, once a, a flux domain is created, it's basically turned off in one or two days. So if you're using that to track stuff and using that as intelligence, it's not really going to work. All right. right. But DNS crawling is fantastic. You can get a lot of stuff, zone transfers, et cetera. Uh, thank you for an excellent talk. Um, I have one comment. Um, 
in Sweden, I prepared to argue that uh, the deer is a risk. <laughs> that that there is a, the deer. The deer is a risk. Yeah, it's a, yeah. In Sweden is a risk. Yeah, the deer is a risk. Yeah. Yeah, the deer is like a pothole. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So we're perfect on time for lunch. Wait and see. Don't don't move because we have more information. But before that, of course, I want to thank Mike for coming thank here. Thank you. Thanks.